Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the 15th anniversary of the Broadcast Museum, and we're lucky enough to have cornered for five minutes only Casey Kasem, who's in town from the West Coast, and who we're going to try and get as much information out of in our couple of minutes as we can. Casey, now I understand, everyone knows that you were the voice of um, Shaggy on the Scooby-Doo Scooby -Doo show. Oh, yeah. We're I understand that you now uh, were not doing it for the movie because you have admitted you no longer sound like 16. Is that Well, it? no, I, I sound... I don't. I no longer look like this. Oh. <laughs> because I, I still do Shaggy on the cartoon shows. As a matter of fact, we we just did 14 new shows that'll debut in the fall. So the the show is so so popular. It's on six times a day on the Cartoon Network. Now it'll be on the Kids WB Network starting in the fall on Saturday mornings and on the Cartoon Network. So it's the most successful show of its kind in the history of television. It's incredibly. Uh, uh, the, the number of people who watch it who are adults. <laughs> and, and can I ask you now, you were doing your music-related material I'm still before doing that. that and you still are. Right. Uh, how did you happen to fall into or come into or, you know, oh, wind up that? from, you know, usually you're here in Hollywood, if you're in music, you're in music and you can't really make a transition to anything else. How did you do it? Well, I started out as a radio actor on the Lone Ranger show out of Detroit, Michigan. Out of Detroit Sergeant, yeah, with Sergeant, Brace Beamer? Brace Beamer. I worked with Brace, and I worked with uh, Fred Foy, the announcer, and the whole cast back starting in 1950. Wow. So when I came to the coast as a disc jockey, I got very involved as an actor in television and movies, and uh, not so much uh, in movies, but quite a bit of television. Right. And then hosting my shows at America's Top Ten for 12 years. And then I started doing voiceovers and also... A cartoon character. So I did about oh, so you about were in it from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. George Trendle, wasn't that George the guy's Trendle, name? that's right. Was George, he a hard guy to work I with? I never met George Trendle. He he was one of the owners of uh, the Lone Ranger show. Yeah, right, right. That's right. But Campbell uh, Trendle Muir eventually owned it. Amazing. You know, not too many people remember Detroit as a uh, emanating you know, uh, national level uh, uh, material, right. but it did, but all those years. They imitated four national shows. Green Hornet. The Green Hornet, you're right. Lone Ranger, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, uh -huh. and Bob Barkley, American Agent. That one I wouldn't have known. But you know, I've got George O'Hare here with me, who does a wonderful show here in Chicago on cable, and George specializes in things that took place a way back. George, did you know that he was from Detroit? No, I didn't know that, but my question is, how long have you been in the business? 1950. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, well, I will never forget, my uncle was the orchestra leader back in the 20s and 30s. His name was Husk O'Hare, the genial gentleman of the year. That's right. And, and, he we used to talk about you all the time. He used to broadcast right from here, the Boulevard Room of the Stevens Hotel on WGN. And every night he'd say, from the beautiful shores of Lake Michigan, from the Boulevard Room of the Stevens Hotel, this is Husk O'Hare, the genial gentleman of the air. He would say, if it's your birthday, happy birthday. If it's anniversary, happy anniversary. And always remember, a smile is worth a million dollars, and it doesn't cost a penny. Da, 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 da. But he talked about you back in... 53, I think, when I went the last time I remember. I got a good mind. No, 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 but you were alone locally, though. In Detroit, that's what I'm, But Husk used to go to the Book Cadillac Hotel. He used to play there. He knew of you. You are something special. Thank you. Thank you very much. Casey, did you play villains, or did you play good guys, or what? I could play, I, my age range was, 50, uh, no, 12 years old to 20 years old. So I could play very young people, and I could play uh, adolescents. How do you like that? And then it was, how, how, where did the idea for the countdown shows come from? Well, back in Detroit, when I was working in a little grocery store, I heard somebody count down the top ten, and I was in radio club at uh, high school, and I said, now, if I were ever going to be a disc jockey, that sounds like the best job of all. Once a week, work and count down the top ten. So 20 years later, I did it. And it worked that out, great. and we've been doing it for 32 years now. That is great, and and to everyone's enjoyment, I got to tell you, how many people do you know that are as popular as you are 
that have been around for 32 years. You know what I mean? You know, you know what the youth involvement. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's a youth-oriented thing, and you, uh, like like my friend, our mutual friend James Brown. Yes. You're one of the exceptions that still has that audience. I think it's great. Thank you very much. Well, I, I want to go ahead. Did you want to say? I, yeah, I've been lucky, and I've I've been able to, to work with people who know what they're doing, and I've worked with. Uh, that's, that's not only the people that uh, I work with, but the people I work for. I've been very lucky. Well, I want to thank you. I, I told you at the beginning we try and keep you just for a short number of minutes. I have Rachel Kane here. Rachel, you want to say anything to Casey before he goes? Yes. Rachel, how do you do? Hi, Casey. Nice to meet you. I just have to say, Casey, I love your voice. I love your presence. And you are one of the kings of rock and roll. Well, thank you very so much. I just want, want to ask you one question. Yes. Rock and roll in 2002, what do you have to say about it? Well, it, it lives, and, uh, and I, I think it always will live. It, it, you know, uh, rock and roll goes, it's been around now for five decades, and it isn't going anywhere but up, because there are different kinds of rock and roll. It's been fractured a little bit now, you know? We know the 50s rock and roll, the 60s, they, they, each decade has its own rock and roll. Well, let me ask you this. Who's your current favorite rock and roll star? I have never said... I can. Everybody has to love Elvis. That's true. Then we you got all the Beatles, love him. right? So I mean, there's so many great stars that uh, it's songs that uh, that that bring back memories, songs that uh, play a role in your life one way or another. And the countdown, the countdown, Casey. <laughs> Thank you. Without the countdown, I don't think I'd know what rock and roll truly was. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. You bet. Well, you're on All Access Pass. Peace. Great. Look, uh, I'm here talking at the Broadcast uh, Museum's 15th uh, Annual Awards uh, event with Evie Arachi Gleberman um, of Chicago and with her husband of, of several years, Herb Gleberman. Now let me tell you a little bit about my guests. Here they are. Evie was a regular on early... Um, Chicago Theater of the Air, Colonel McCormick's operas and operettas. And that was set. radio or television? That, that was radio. In, in, the, in the late 40s. In the late, late 40s. 40s. Can you believe that? We, we did all the operas. I did Madame Butterfly. We went all over the United States, uh -huh. and uh, we had guest artists from the Metropolitan and all the opera companies, and we did the operas, operettas, and musicals, and I did that for four years, And but my earliest appearance on radio was when I was four years old. My uncle had a little radio show. He was called The Singing Milkman from Bowman Dairy, and I sang and recited a poem. And then at the age of nine, I was on WMAQ Chicago with the NBC Orchestra with Jane Froman, Little Jackie Heller, and the host was Gary, uh, Gary Moore. Gary and, Moore. And that was coast to coast, and I was on that show for many, many weeks My gosh, at that nine. Was, that was before he had a secret. Even. That's right. <laughs> before right? he had a secret. He was, from, yeah. he, was, he was working out of Chicago. That's right. See, I didn't uh, even know he worked out of Chicago. Oh, That's yes, great. yes. And then I had, I had a, a radio show uh, uh, before Chicago Theater of the Air, 15 minutes a day, with Chicago's Bill Hamilton, one of our fine radio announcers for the Chicago Motor Club, and then later went on to do opera, uh, Broadway musicals, and television in the early 50s, doing the Ron Terry show and other shows at GM. There was a lot of variety in local uh, oh, yes, a, stuff then, wasn't variety. there? I mean, it's not, right. Now it seems like Everything you can barely good. ever see a local right. oriented right. show. This was all live, and if we made a mistake or we blew a line or whatever, it didn't matter. You just <laughs> went on and rehearsals and live shows all the time. I was mentioning that around the same time Johnny Frigo yes, was yes, on the right. uh, WLS oh, uh, Barn Dance. Mm -hmm. And this was about, what, 20 years, years. after... Mm -hmm. Sam and Henry had left Chicago to become Amos and Andy Andy, that's right. from yeah. WGN, right? All that's right. That. They got a good it's memory. Amazing. Oh, yeah, memory. Yeah. And, you know, most people forget that, they, that the soaps, uh, the radio soaps originated in, in Chicago. All the great soaps came from Chicago uh, in the, the, the late 30s, 40s, where they were radio soaps. 
Little Jack Armstrong, Sky King, and the romance and, uh, of uh, Helen Trent, and Stella Dallas, <laughs> and Stella <laughs> Dallas, all those. This the second Mrs. Burton. Well, uh, yeah, and Ma, what's the, Ma, the Jewish Ma one? Bergen. Mrs. Goldberg, Ma, Molly yeah, Goldberg. Goldberg. Yeah, Goldberg. Yeah. Sure. All and those what shows. about uh, can a little mining a girl uh, from, from the mining, mining town, town of yes. Silver Creek, Colorado, <laughs> find, find happiness with uh, English yeah. riches right. and all most handsome Lord Lord Henry right. Britain? Sure. Right, right. And in those Wasn't things, that done uh, by, um, what's her name, uh, another Chicago, and I think she mo moved yeah, to Miami yeah. a, a couple years ago. Forgot. But a lot of Chicagoans. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and in those days, there was so much work for, for actresses, singers. We, you know, we were working all the time. You could work 52 weeks a year in Chicago between the, the supper clubs, uh, radio, and then when television came into its own, and then the club dates. You know, this was such a big convention town. Sometimes, there were times when I did two club dates a night, wow. go from one hotel to another, doing shows for conventions and things. Who were, the, who were the Gary Moores? Who were the people who went on to be really, really famous that were based here at the time uh, you were here? Mike Douglas. Remember Mike Douglas? He was a sure. fine singer. And a lot of times Mike and I would find ourselves sitting in the same audition rooms, auditioning for different shows. Oh he was my. a wonderful singer before he had his uh, television yeah. show. And of course, Dave Garraway. Oh, yeah, Dave sure. Garraway had a wonder, wonderful show, yeah. <laughs> I don't Chicago. know how we lost all that. Yeah. Well, we times changed and tastes, unfortunately, changed. Yeah. Not necessarily for the better. No, that's true. And of course, New York and L.A. wanted it so bad, that's right. and apparently that's right. our municipality was kind of, uh, sure. sort of like really didn't care one way or the that's other, right. yeah. which is a shame. Yeah. Now, Herb, tell me, I know that you've done several shows nationwide right. on your subject, which happens to be divorce law, right. and that you're one of the outstanding authorities in the area. And you've been going at it practically longer than anyone else in the country. At the moment, I think I hold the title. I've been practiced divorce law literally exclusively for 48 years. I don't think anybody else has practiced exclusively for that law. Mm -hmm. And my practice takes me all over the United States. I just don't confine myself to Illinois. I can practice anywhere I want as long as I associate with a local attorney on it, what we call pro hot visa, or this case only. I get permission. I've tried cases in almost all the states of the United States. Uh, I had two radio shows of my own over NBC for seven years. One was called Ask the Lawyer. I took phone calls on the air. The other one was called Law and Controversy. And I got that show quite by accident. I was doing a book tour, my first book called Confessions of a Divorce Lawyer. And the last place they booked me for interviews was Chicago. And uh, NBC just has started the show. great charity work. <laughs> NBC just started a show called Law and Controversy. And um, the, uh, Pat Cassidy, who's now at WBBM, was the original host. But when I finished the show, he said, Herb, he says, you know, you did this so effortlessly. He says, I'm a newsman. I don't enjoy doing this. He says, I'm going to turn this tape over to Bert Sherwood, who was then the station manager. I said, oh, sure, you know, water off a duck's back. Next week, I got a call from Bert. Before I knew it, I signed a contract, and I was doing law and controversy. And after a week, he said, you know, he called me. There are people that are calling in. I want to talk to you. He said, how about doing another show? And so I did ask the lawyer. How long did you do this? <laughs> Seven years. My goodness. Man. Yeah. Well, the question I want you to all talk about the 40s and all this. How is it that you folks did stuff so far back and anybody that you would ask would say you guys are in your 30s yourself? <laughs> well, 30, oh, not, 30, 39. Oh. Well, we found... Now, 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 cut that out. We found the pill called the elixir of life. Uh -huh. And you know what that pill is? What is the love that we have for each oh. other. Because oh, we're going to be married 46 years 46 in November. Years. Oh, that's right. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You're both such nice people. Mm -hmm. And I wish you totally continued Thank you. success. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for taking a few minutes to oh, it, talk it's our, with us. It's our, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Happy Arachi Lieberman. <laughs> right. And Herb Lieberman. Thank, Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>Thank you very much and I'm here right now with Thea Flum. We're at the 15th anniversary of the Broadcast Museum. Thea is on her way to eat and I grabbed her and I asked her please, please talk to us for five minutes.
and tell us what you're doing and what you're doing out of Chicago. I want to preface my remarks with Thea by saying that of all the people in the Chicago area who has never left and come back, Thea does probably more independent um, you know, uh, uh, production of shows that get syndicated all over not only the country but the world. Thea, tell us about some of the shows that we'll see on the Home and Garden Network. Right. Come on, tell us some of them. Okay, I'm happy to tell you. We're doing uh, two series that are running currently on the Home and Garden Network. We're doing a series called At the Auction, and the other one is called The Appraisal Fair, and they're on every day. And we're now working on two new specials for them, one that will run at Christmas time about toys, the toys we grew up with, and another one about incredible basements. Basement? <laughs> Basement. What do you know? And then I'm working on two series with Channel 11 for national PBS distribution, a science series called Look and a comedy series with Denise DeClue and Tim Kazarinski. Oh, they're uh, who wrote about, partners for yes, years. Yes, and who are my co-production partners along with Channel 11 in a new series called Comedy Tonight that we hope will be on PBS uh, before the year is out. So. Uh, you see, it, it just goes to show all you people out there listening who are interested in show business that if you put your mind to it, and you really work hard, as Thea has always worked, you can, in fact, create successful money-making productions out of Chicago. And that's what we've always tried to do and try to emphasize. It can be done. And you, you show it more than anyone. We know all you. your, your competition, Bill Curtis, yeah. Yeah, you know, with his oh, Bill, national reputation, all that. Scott Can't deny Curtis. it. But, you know, you never left Chicago. You've always been here, and you've been successful, and I think it's wonderful. One question. The appraisal show, or the auction show, which, which came first on that appraisal show? The one in England, or...? No, actually, of... we did appraisals on our auction show before the English show came here. But the truth is that the English show was really what the network take, took a look and saw how well that was doing and asked us to expand the appraisal segment of our show into a full show. So whether or not it would have become a full show without the success of the Antiques Road Show, I don't know. But we were there first. We didn't have them. So that's good. That's cool. And you've heard it first in Chicago, you see? All right, well, I don't want to hold you up from eating. But thanks for spending a couple of minutes. You certainly are an icon for those people, to somebody that I can point to and say, see, see, it can happen here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hi, it's Rachel Kane, and I'm here at the Museum of Broadcast Gala with the lovely and beautiful Lori Brady. Oh, how nice to be here. Now, Lori, you're on the board, and I know you do a lot of charitable work around town. How do you feel about the 15th anniversary? I think it's wonderful, and I think there will be a, certainly 15 more, at least. <laughs> at least! It's so nice to see some of the people we haven't seen in years, like you Downs is here, and wonderful. And, you know, I know everybody's birthday, so it's great to know. And, you know, this is, we just had an eclipse uh, on June the 10th, and that's a very big thing. That happens, you know, only twice a year. Now, for those of you that don't know, but I'm sure that a lot of you watching do know, Lori Brady is one of the most prominent astrologers in the world. And I want to say this lady's always right. Sometimes she's right to the point of where it's, it's frightening. Well, my claim to fame, I was the astrologer for the Reagans when they were in the White House. And I like to think that he's still alive because of me. <laughs> because every president that was elected in a zero year died in office. He was the first one who did not. And I was the one that warned him the day that they shot at him. They put extra security on. And it's very strange. The name of James Brady got the bullet. Ah, <laughs> my name's whoa, that's not related. <laughs> but you actually did warn the president. That's really interesting. <laughs> now I want to ask you, because since you're into astrology and since today's the anniversary and we're all rather celebrating in this wonderful year of 2002, astrologically, what do you see coming up for 2003? 
Well, I think it's going to be very good, and this is an apropos anniversary because it's in Gemini, and Gemini is a sign of communication. So uh, they couldn't have picked, you know, I'm sure when they, they knew nothing about astrology when they picked the date, but there's no such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> right, I agree with that, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we both have one thing in common, and that is a friendship with... Uh, with, what is it, Lori Vitale, Miss Vitale, Carol, Carol Vitale. Vitale. I'm on her show Carol. often, yeah. She, she used to have a show in Florida and one in California now. I just go to the one in California because she gave up the one in, uh, the, in Florida. And she is so beautiful. Oh, she, I know she's an ex-Playboy bunny, that I remember. Yes, yeah, she is. Yeah, she, but if you notice lately, she wears a hat with a veil I, because she had bad plastic surgery, and uh, I think she's suing the... Uh, the doctor, so she's got a little hat with a veil on it now, and she, but she's still beautiful. <laughs> well, luckily you and I don't need a hat with a veil. I hope not. <laughs> beautiful and in charge here today, Lori Brady, Rachel Kane, signing off. Thank you. Rachel Kane here with my hero, Walter Jacobson. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hi. So, it's nice to be here with you, finally. I really feel as though I've, uh, this is a moment in the history of, well, the Museum of Broadcast, as well as the history of Rachel Kane. I'm historical. Rachel Kane, I'm proud to be here with you. Well, I'm proud to be here with you. Let me ask you this. Yes. It's 2003, and so much has happened with 9-11, etc., etc. What do you feel? Where do you feel the world is really going? Oh, to hell in a handbasket unless we can find a way to prevent it. I think the world is in very serious trouble, don't you? I All do. of us are in very serious trouble. I don't think there's any way we're going to stop the terrorist bombers. No, and that is the thing that I, I guess we all really worry about that every day, which sure. is really a shame, but we have to. There could be one here tonight, and I don't think there's anything that uh, George Bush or John Ashcroft or anybody else can do about it. No, I and don't And that's think the tragedy. That and is all the of tragedy. this reorganization of the government isn't going to make a lot of difference. Do you feel a little bit safer? Because though we both love New York, do you feel Chicago's a bit safer? No, I do not feel it's safer. Mm. I think it can happen anytime in any place, and I do believe that it's going to happen. Something bad is going to happen. I hate to be such a pessimist, but I believe those who say it's going to happen. Because I don't think there is any way that any of these terrorists can be stopped. No, because they really don't care if they live or die. They have such a strange kind of psychological makeup. Right. What do you think makes these people so different than the way we are here in America? They just don't have the same value on life that we have. And they believe that being martyrs will get them to the right places in the afterlife. So it's good for them to become martyrs and kill themselves. They want to. But on a positive side, because now all of yeah, our viewers are going to say, Walter right. Jacobson, right. Let's be positive. he said gloom and doom, but I know I feel the same way that you do. On a positive side, what do you think is, that is really positive and fun is happening tonight here at oh, the well, Benefit? This, this, of course, is positive, because all of the, for me anyway, all of the people I've worked with for all these years, we're all here and having a wonderful time having kind of a reunion. And, and I that's love very positive. That is very positive. Because you've seen a lot of people you haven't seen in quite oh, a few I years. Oh, I have. That's really true. Who are some of the people? Well, I just ran into Drury, and I have John Drury, and I haven't talked to him in a long time. And Scott Craig, and Warner Saunders, and Arthur Nielsen, and, oh my, I could just go on forever. Also, we have had support television stations over the years. In the beginning, it was Channel 7 who made the first donation in the name of Frank Wells and Fabi Flynn. They helped launch us. <laughs> in the beginning, that general manager and every general manager that followed has supported us. Their support has grown. And to ABC and ABC7, please say thank you to Emily Barr. Emily Barr.
the piano. This is the Society Man. All right, we're here at the 15th anniversary of the Museum of Broadcast here in Chicago with my hero, Walter Jacobson. And my heroine, Rachel Kane. So Walter, about tonight, tell me about some of the people who you haven't seen in a long time and just how you feel about the benefit and just everything that's happening. Well, I am just having a wonderful time because a lot of us old timers are getting together for the first time again in a long time. John Drury and Paul Harvey and Warner Sanders and and you know what? It's just nice to see these people who we don't get to see as often as we'd like to. So this is a wonderful occasion. And you have to hand it to Bruce Dumont for putting this whole thing together. And to you for doing this, right? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you, Walter Jacobson, are on All Access Pass. Well, thank you very much. We'll see you on TV. And thank you for that. Thank you. Miss Meadows, hi, I'm Jay Ross. Yes, we do a small uh, TV show, but it's seen by most of the people here in Chicago, Good. called All Access Pass. And we are taking advantage of our All Access status to ask you a few questions if Go you'll right cooperate. Tell me, now, you were in several quiz shows many, many, many times in the earlier days of television, right? Well, I uh, was an actress for years on Broadway and in the movies. And when I went to New York, uh, Mark Goodson put me on I've Got a Secret, and I was on it every week for seven years, and only left when we moved to California. Now, what I want to ask is, we know that there's a game show channel going yes, on now. with all my old shows. <laughs> How's your fan mail? Do you know it's the darndest thing? Suddenly, everywhere I go, people say, I saw you on TV the other night. <laughs> those beautiful old game shows. The only sad thing is that everybody that I worked with on I've Got a Secret for seven years has gone. Everybody. Gee, I didn't and realize And what's that. my line, too? Arlene Francis just died a few months ago. Dorothy Kilgall and John Daly, they're all gone. But they're great. They're, you, know, you, you can watch them, and they're just as valid yeah, absolutely. now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Well, I thought that your fan mail might be the picking. The fan mail and the people come up to me on the street. Oh, that's just good. Well, you certainly deserve it. And uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Now, you were in theater mostly before that and I some was films, in too. I eight Broadway shows, uh -huh. and then MGM signed me, uh -huh. and I made movies with all those glorious old stars. My first movie was with Catherine Hepburn, Robert Taylor, and Bob Mitchum. Wow. And I made pictures with Tyrone Power, David Niven, Gregory Peck, all those wonderful... And you married beautiful. Steve and Allen. I married the biggest star of them all. And he, he was in like his 30s at the time, wasn't he? I think he was in his 30s and he seemed always so much older. When I first met him, I said to my sister, how old do you suppose he is? Because he was so serious and we were all, you know, uh, more... <laughs> Well, not as bright as he was. We'll put it that oh, way. Oh, he was a genius. How many books did he write? 30, was he it? He finished his uh, 54th okay. book the day he died. Unbelievable. And uh, our son, Bill, and I have been working on it. We got it on the bestseller list. We've been all over the country. Well, I mean, those of those... And it's called Bulgarians at the Gate. And it is about television. It's about the media. It's oh, that's great. It's about television, radio, uh, music today. It's a very important book. Well, I, I read several of his books. I always enjoyed it, and he had such an unbelievable breadth of knowledge. Yeah. But, you know, what's interesting is, is what's almost slipped by in your comments 
was how serious he was. Very serious man. You know, because for a guy who's, who's remembered in many people's minds in that scene with his hat, <laughs> and uncontrollably laughing, right, etc. Right. Well, he, he took had, his comedy seriously. You see, he was from Chicago. You know that. Uh, yes, I did not that. know that. Oh yeah, he was from Chicago. I and met the two of them in New York. Well, his parents were Vaudevillians, and he ah. grew up in show business. Well, and with, a, with an M, with an M. Uh, uh, Ma Montrose. Montrose. Montrose uh, B. Allen. Montrose. That's right. The Bell. Bell Montrose. Bell Montrose. I, I, I was close. Milton Berle says she was the funniest woman ever in vaudeville. Wow. She worked with us in Vegas and she stole the whole show. She was brilliant. Great. I loved the piano playing. That and, was and, like the piano and was... idea when you realized that he was a poor boy, never had a piano in his life, never had a lesson. Oh my played goodness. by ear. Wrote all those songs. Well, he's in the Guinness Book of Records as the most prolific composer ever. And his song, this could be the start of something, this year, start of something big, was in Woody Allen's last movie and Bette Midler's. And I didn't realize he wrote this could be the start of something big. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. what she was just oh. saying. Yeah. I know, this is the first time I've ever really been Oh, uh, yeah, not only that, I mean, it's just, uh, it's, with all these guys living into their 90s, etc., I really feel that we were, you know, I mean, you of course too, that we lost them way, way too early. It's just we were wrong. so sad because we were wrong. he uh, he was great. Well, let me ask you too. I mean, we could talk about Steve Allen for hours, and I'm sure you could too. Let's ask you at least a couple questions about your sister. Well, Everyone sister, loves your sister, Audrey I, I Meadow. I know, but my sister died five years ago. Yeah, I know. No, no, yeah. But I mean, just in general, people are interested. Yes. Did she have a good relationship, according to what you knew between her and Jackie? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were yeah. friends. Oh, absolutely. I can't imagine anybody not being a friend of Jackie's. Um, you know, my sister and I were under contract to RCA Victor, and I think I was on his show about four times singing or working with Steve when he was in, when Jackie was in Miami. And Steve and I were the guests one Christmas on the show. I adored Jackie. He was, a, talk about talent, he was also talented. He wasn't quite so versatile, I don't think, as Steve. No, but he was who a could be? But he was a great comedy actor. In fact, he was, he was a great actor, actor, right? Well, but uh, he was also a very serious true. actor. And he was a very physical guy. I mean, he could take yeah. a fall, Things like that most people don't realize, you know. Yeah, he was a wonderful man. But we were talking about the early days of television and what the salaries were and what the conditions were. So different than now, yeah. And, and what the case of so-called residuals were not. There were no residuals yeah, exactly. because there were no replays. Exactly. And it was my brother, who was a brilliant lawyer, graduated first in his class from Cornell Law, who said to the lawyers of the Gleason show, now, if you ever play any of these again, I want my sister paid. And they said, where would we play them? And my brother said, well, the operative word is not where, it's if. And it was put in the contract, and the only person to this day, we still get the money, because the show was played all the time. But that's wonderful. And so actually you did, you were protected. Well, my son handles uh, all my sister's business, you Your son is a lawyer. No, my son was the head of Mary Tyler Moore's. He was the president of MGM, wow. and he was a young executive at CBS. But poor, darling, brilliant Art Carney has never gotten one penny, neither has Joyce Randolph. The only person that's ever gotten any money is Art Carney. Unbelievable. Thanks to your brother. Yes. Thanks to my brother, my brilliant brother. Well, that's great. I'm an entertainment attorney in real life myself, so believe me, I can appreciate what you're saying. Do you saying. know what her salary was the first year? What's that? Do you know what my sister's salary was the first year? No, but everyone would love to know. I tell everyone today because we read about these young kids and they're getting a million dollars for... One you show. Know, for one show. That's true. She got $165 a week every other week because she wasn't on every week. Uh. And the show was only on three years in the beginning. And she didn't even have a contract. She was a day player. It's amazing. Lots how of did changes. She, how did she get the job, you know, By from Perk Kelton? Yeah, it was very sad because Perk Kelton was no more a communist than you and I are. Oh, was that But that? she was in Red Channels. 
and they wouldn't use her. And I, I mean, uh, Jackie said, I will not do the show without her. And it came to the last week before they went on the air and they had no Alice. And my sister was walking along the street one night and Jackie's agent came up to Audrey's agent and said, we're desperate, desperate. We've got to go on the air in one week and we have no Alice. And Audrey's agent said, well, gee, I can't think of anybody. anybody. And Audrey said, well, how about me? And, uh, oh, yeah, look at that. You heard that? Well, and so he said, oh, honey, that's cute. And, and he went right on. Call me if you can think of anybody. And again, Audrey said the same thing. And finally he said, well, honey, I don't know who you are, but I'm on my way up to Jackie's. Do you want to come with me? They went up. And Jackie said, uh, nice to meet you, honey. Would you just step outside in the hall a minute while I talk to the men? He said, are you all out of your minds? Who is this? Turned her down. She came home. She was dressed real nice or something. Wasn't um, that it? Well, uh, it, it isn't that she was dressed so real nice. She was young from New England, uh -huh. didn't look the part of She the... was classy. Yes, yeah. too classy. So uh, she came home. I called a photographer uh -huh. and made herself look awful. And mother was in New York. Audrey and I were sharing an apartment. And I was on I've Got a Secret. And mother made her look awful. Uh -huh. And the man took the pictures. And the next day, she had her agent take them up to Gleason. And he said, that's the face I want. Who is that? <laughs> they said, that's who you met last that's night. And he said, OK, sign her. No contract. Every other week, three or four lines, because you used to do a lot of characters. And scale. It's an amazing story. Well, amazing. She, she was the part in real life. She had that wonderful poker face. She had the nasal voice. And it, she was it. She was just it. She had a quality that was perfect for him. Perfect. What was it like having another sister, both being sisters in show business? Well, she had a very difficult time. She lived with me all the years I was on Broadway auditioning, auditioning, and people were saying to me, friends, Jane, tell her to get out of the business. That poker face and that voice, she'll never make it. All the things that made her, they wouldn't buy. Then when I went under contract to MGM, she came out to Hollywood. She lived with me all those years, not a break. And it just shows you, our business is luck. Our oh, yeah. business is luck. Luck, I think, don't you think persistence as well? Like yes. believing in yourself. Being in the right but place my at the dear, right time, though, is important. yeah, exactly. I never could persist it. I never went to dramatic school. I was in stock in the summer. A man saw me, wanted me to go to Hollywood. The biggest producer on Broadway called him and said, "Do you have any young Catherine Hepburn types in Hollywood?" Because that's what they always they thought I do. was. Exactly. And he said, "We've just seen a girl. We want to sign. We'd rather she did a play." The man interviewed me, never asked me to read, gave me the part. The play ran two years. We did a year on Broadway, then we came to Chicago, and I played the Selwyn Theater, and I lived in this hotel. Oh, wow. It was the Stevens Hotel. What was the play? The play was called uh, Spring Again. Kirk Douglas had one line in it, understudied the boy who played opposite me, and I went from play to play to play until they took me to Hollywood uh, under contract MGM. So you worked a lot more than your sister then? Oh, of course. Much My more. sister never really did Broadway or anything. She did one movie. Um, when I went to Hollywood, my first movie was with Katherine Hepburn ah. and Robert Taylor and Robert Mitchum. My second one with Robert Montgomery. My third with Tyrone Power. My fourth with Gregory Peck. My fifth with David Niven. It was all the great, you know, big male stars of that period. But my heart ruled my life, and I married twice. And when you marry stars and you have children, you don't have that, especially if you've made it when you're very young. You don't have that drive to, all of my friends who kept that drive, they were divorced, they're not married today. Um, and I worked, of course, all the time, but it wasn't that the work came first. I worked with Steve, we worked in Vegas, we worked in Carnegie Hall, we worked all over the country, we worked on the stage together, but I, he wanted me to do it. 
It wasn't that I wanted to you do it. You didn't push for yourself? Oh, no. I didn't care about it anymore. And now that he's gone, people call me all the time to do things that I have no desire to do anything, except travel around the country selling his book. And at least let people know what it was like in the early days of Hollywood. Oh, well, Because it's Hollywood. such a wonderful story that I Hollywood. think a lot of people want to know. And the, all those glamorous, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I miss him terribly because that was my life. But I'm here with my son, and I have 12 grandchildren, and three stepsons, and four great-grandchildren, and I've had the most wonderful life in the whole Certainly world. Certainly success if you ask me. I say so, the too. Most Wonderful, wonderful life. Two years ago, I did my last movie. I played Michelle Pfeiffer's mother with Bruce Willis, you know. What the movie was that? Story of Us. Ah. And Rob Reiner called me up and said, I'm sending you a script, and if you like it, I'd like you to play Michelle Pfeiffer's mother. Um, yeah, right up until Steve died, I was working all the time. And I, today, no desire. You guys were a great couple. I actually had the opportunity to meet you two in New York. And you were such a, you know, vibrant, good-looking, wonderful couple that I can really understand your feelings about that. But I'm glad to see you here, and I'm glad to hear these stories Thank because so I think very Thank important. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. Well, this is one of my favorite cities. I think it's the most American. I know that sounds peculiar, but to me, for foreigners, you know, I wasn't born in America. I was born and raised in China. I didn't and know And the first time I came to Chicago at 18 at the Selwyn Theater, this town, I had never known a town where there were gangsters and big hotels. When I stayed in this hotel, it was the biggest hotel in the world. Ah. And the, and the ballroom was the largest ballroom in the wow. world. And there was a club here called the, the uh, Chaperie. Right. right. And there was a famous photographer who photographed me called Maurice Seymour. Maurice and he Seymour. took me, me there one night. I can still remember the dancer was Jack Cole. And the man, uh, the photographer said to me, oh, don't drink that ginger ale. Try this. He was Russian. And it was vodka. Uh-oh. And straight uh -huh. vodka. He was oh, drinking. no. And he got me to drink it, and I was sick all night long in this hotel. I was at his 50th anniversary party, Maurice Seymour. Oh, my. It was a wonderful photographer. Is he still living? Oh, no. No, no, no. no. Years ago. No, okay. he was an old man. He was man. with all his Russian friends. Oh, he was a great photographer. I've definitely heard of him. Oh, oh I, yeah. Did, uh, it's amazing. Everybody. He did more Hollywood people than That's right. photographers in Hollywood. And I just found some of the pictures of me that he took. Uh, recently. Uh -huh. uh, I bet they're beautiful. Well, they're, they're nice. He was a very good photographer. But when I see all these old pictures, uh, you know, like with Ty Power, me in, in love scenes with Tyrone Power uh -huh. or the different ones, it's, um, it's, it brings back memories of this wonderful life that I had. Very Your exciting. parents were missionaries. In China for yeah. 14 years. And we fled during the war. In fact, we had to get out. We were in the middle of a meal, and we had to leave. I have to leave early in the morning, so uh, I'm going... We don't want to bother you, but we couldn't stop. I mean, oh, I know. I normally, I, don't... I stop people at five minutes. No, no, say... I couldn't stop uh, talking to you, but the thing is that my son, it's Father's Day, uh -huh. and he wants to get home to his little children. Absolutely. So, so nice meeting thank you. you. So thank much. you. Lovely right. to we're see really you. Appreciate... Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Happy Father's Day to everyone. And it was lovely to see you. Very nice. Can I give you my card? Yes, of course you will. Listen, I do rights of publicity. Oh. Uh, you know, I Entertainment know that, law, the special. It's probably been approached by uh, Roger Richmond or Global Icons or something like that. But you know, you know, the ones that handle uh, the use of name and, and image for T-shirts, for oh. products, and stuff oh. like that. Well, that's what I do. I know you probably got somebody, but if not, I'm always willing to give free advice. How nice of you. Thank you. All right. Especially thank you. Thank you. All right.